to be here this morning. Likewise, it's a joy to see everyone who's with us. We're always glad to have visitors, and again, this morning, we're blessed by your presence. So we hope that you will stay around. Let us meet with you afterwards. Let us get to know you. And certainly we hope that as we look at what the Bible says this morning, that the time that we spend together is beneficial, is profitable for your spiritual well-being. I want to commend the congregation for a couple of things as we begin this morning. The total, you've probably seen it, but the total was $7,968 that you gave for the special contribution last Sunday for the China Mission. This specifically is earmarked to help children, orphans who need life-saving surgeries. And so you gave with such compassion, with such love, certainly you're to be commended for that. Likewise, we want to commend those who helped yesterday in our sister Candy Jones's memorial. Uh, the family left these beautiful flowers here, and so we're grateful for that. But thank you to everyone who had a part in that. Uh, likewise, yesterday and Friday, we had the marriage retreat, the couples retreat. Forty-five were there on Friday and Saturday. And that was a great number, but we even had six couples at the very end who had to cancel due to sickness, due to illness. And so a great number was represented. Daniel led us in some great lessons Friday night and Saturday. And so that's not only a good time to, you know, come together as husband and wife, but also to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ. You build both bonds a little bit stronger with events like that. And so we appreciate everyone who put forth effort in that event. Well, this morning we're continuing to look a little bit at marriage. Now, you don't have to confine this lesson to marriage. But notice what we're dealing with, and you'll see that this can apply to marriage. It applies to any situation outside of marriage, to individuals certainly to couples, to congregations. We're looking at the art of problem solving. The art of problem solving. Next Sunday morning, Lord willing, we're going to focus upon the act of problem solving. Well, let's begin with some quick observations. As you think about marriage, as you think about problems that come because of marriage, notice this. Rest assured, there will be problems. Marriage is not the cause of problems, but it can be the occasion. And we want to emphasize that. God, in His kind and wise intention, saw that it's not good for man to be alone, and so He made a wonderful helpmeet, Eve for Adam. Genesis 2 and verse 18. But rest assured that there will be problems, as we stated, individually. As you go through life, you're going to face personal problems. And so it's only to be expected, as two live in such close proximity, that from time to time, problems arise. And so the art of problem solving. Think about this. Go through the Bible... And if we have much information over a particular couple, you'll probably find, you'll probably learn that they dealt with some problems. They had to navigate their way through some troubles. Adam and Eve, no exception. Yes, they bought, brought trouble into their own marriage because of sin, but then later on Cain, their son, rose up and killed his brother Abel. They had to deal with problems. Abraham and Sarah, no exception, dealt with problems. Job and his wife, Hosea and Gomer, dealing with problems. Potiphar and his wife. You step into the New Testament, Joseph and Mary, even before they were married, as they were betrothed, they faced problems. Remember John 16 and verse 33? Jesus said, In the world you will have tribulation, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. 
And so as we think about the art, the skill, the wisdom of problem solving, again, number one, rest assured that there will be problems. Do not count problems in your marriage as something strange. You remember Peter writes similar words to his brethren in 1 Peter 4 and verse 12. He's writing about suffering and his point is this is natural for the child of God. Don't count suffering as some strange thing. Paul would say in 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 3, we're destined for this. Well, we need to understand that again in marriage, there are going to be some obstacles to overcome. There are going to be some difficulties that must be faced. There are going to be some problems that need to be solved. Notice another observation. Recognize that these problems threaten to undermine the harmony and happiness of your marriage. This is something very important. God, once again, intended that marriage bless humanity. There is to be harmony. There is to be happiness. But problems threaten to disrupt that. Remember in Psalm 133 and verse 1, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. That unity among brethren is special. It is precious. It's priceless. And likewise, between husband and wife, that unity, that harmony is again precious. It is worthwhile. And so problems threaten to disrupt that, the harmony, the happiness. You remember in 2 Kings, the fourth chapter in verse 26, what the Shunammite woman was asked. She was asked, is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with the child? Now remember her response was, it is well. And it can be. Marriage should be. But sometimes we say, well, it's not as good as it could be. It's because of problems. It's because of trouble within the home, within the marriage. It threatens to disrupt the harmony, the happiness of that home, the couple. Notice number three. Realize that these problems must be dealt with. Many times we think they're just going to go away. Many times we compare our problems to somebody else's problems. Ours don't seem to be quite as big, and so let's just leave things alone. Remember the nature of problems. 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 6, a little leaven leavens the entire lump. Problems just do not disappear into the air. They don't simply go away. Problems become worse. And so they must be dealt with. Any problem in the home, doesn't matter how little it is, doesn't matter how large it is, it needs to be dealt with. Now consider something else. Number four. Remember that behind any problem stands Satan. There's an interesting verse in the book of Esther. Now Esther is talking about Haman. She is exposing him for the first time to King Ahasuerus. And remember in that context, she says, A foe and an enemy is this wicked Haman. Well, she was right. That was true. That man was not what he pretended to be. He was a foe. He was an enemy. He was wicked. Well, the same thing is true concerning Satan. As you look at your life individually, he's no friend. As you consider him as a couple, as a congregation, there's no affinity there with Satan. He is a foe. He's an enemy. You remember what Jesus said about the wheat and the tares? Concerning those tares in Matthew 13, he says, an enemy has sown them. And then in Matthew 13 and verse 39, he points out who that enemy is. The enemy is the devil. Again, behind every problem in a person's life, behind every obstacle in a couple's marriage, 
behind any disruption of harmony and unity within a congregation, there stands Satan. He understands what Jesus taught in Matthew 12 and verse 25. Any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. Any city or house divided against itself shall not stand. Jesus taught that, but again, Satan understands that. That's why if he can disrupt the harmony, he can overcome, he can conquer. And so the problems need to be dealt with. We need to recognize that behind those problems, there lurks the enemy. The enemy of our soul, the enemy of our salvation, the enemy of the home and marriage. You remember he's as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. And the last observation before we mention some things, rectify every problem with God's help. There is a remedy to any and all problems, and they can be dealt with, they can be overcome with God's help. Remember the song that we sang? I think it was the very first song. God will take care of you. And He will. And so with God's help, that's why the scripture reading this morning, Romans 8 and verse 31, if God be for us, who can be against us? And God is for humanity. He's not willing that any perish, but all come to repentance. 1 Peter 3, 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. And so he's for us. He's for your home. He's for your family. He's for your marriage. He's for your husband, for your wife. He wants these things to happen and be happy and be prosperous. And so with God's help. You remember in Nehemiah 2 and verse 20? God will give us success. That's what Nehemiah told his brethren. Later on in Nehemiah 4 and verse 20, our God will fight for us. And so he has challenged them to fight. Fight for your brethren. Fight for your homes. Fight for your wives. Fight for your daughters. Read that whole context. And his point is, as we fight the good fight of faith, 1 Timothy 6 and verse 12, our God will fight for us. Well, these are necessary observations. Now notice this, the biblical way to solve problems. And I want to emphasize that, the biblical way. There's a way that seems right unto a man, but the ways thereof are the ways of death. Proverbs 14 and verse 12. Problems arise in the home, if people do not go to the scriptures, if they do not seek the biblical solution, remedy, then they found a way that seems right, but it's not right. Emphasize that. It seems right to man, but the ways thereof are the ways of death. That's why we see the problem in our society today. People are experiencing problems. They're experiencing the same problems that homes and families and couples and marriages have always faced. Yet, they're not turning to God. They're seeking the way that seems right. Well, notice this. The biblical way to solve problems? Scripturally. Remember what we just said. Proverbs 14 and verse 12. There's a way that seems right unto a man, but the ways thereof are the ways of death. Now, couple that with Psalm 19 and verse 9. Because David says there, the statutes of the Lord are right. Notice that. There's a way that seems right, but it's not right. The statutes of the Lord are right. And remember, they end up in happiness. They bring about rejoicing in that same verse. It leads to the rejoicing of the heart. Deal with problems, not as some strange thing, but understand problems will happen and deal with them scripturally. In Isaiah 8 and verse 19, Isaiah mentions that his people, they would go to the spiritists, to the mediums, those who whisper and mutter, and then the question is asked, should not a people consult their God 
Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? What a great question. What a wonderful observation. Through inspiration, God is saying, why? Why do you go to these people, whisperers, mutterers, spiritists, mediums? They're dead spiritually. Why do you consult the dead on behalf of the living? And that's still a great question today. Why, when problems arise, do we run out and buy the hottest selling book on marriage and read it? Now, behind that book may be a very spiritually minded author, maybe a brother in Christ. But many times that's not the case. It is what we've talked about already, Proverbs 14 and verse 12. There's a way that seems right, and that's what that book is all about, a way that seems right, but the end thereof leads to death. Why do we consult the dead, those who are dead spiritually, on behalf of the living and the living's problems? Should we not rather consult our God? Certainly. All Scripture is given by inspiration. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. And so consult the Scriptures. Deal with problems scripturally. Let's see what God has to say about this situation. What truths, what principles can we apply to help this, this trouble, these problems? You remember Acts 20 and verse 32? Paul said, Now I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. You see, God's word, it results in rejoicing. It's able to build us up. If we're going to deal with problems and solve those problems, we will do so scripturally. That's the only thing that's going to bring about that positive result. But notice this, quickly. Deal with problems quickly. Remember what we stated before in the observations? Problems must be dealt with. And now we're adding quickly. Turn with me to Matthew, the fifth chapter. I do want us to read a couple of verses in connection with this. In Matthew 5, look what we find here. Matthew 5 Begin with me in verse 23. And remember now, specifically, we're dealing here with some unrighted wrongs. And that's usually where our problems begin and end within marriage. We have wronged our spouse. We've said something, we've done something that hopefully we regret. We're wondering how to fix the problem well, notice God's wisdom, His insight. Here's how you deal with unrighted wrongs. In Matthew 5 and verse 23, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. Now notice this. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Do you see how serious Jesus is? about harmony between brothers and sisters. He tells them, if you're there in the temple, if you brought your offering to be sacrificed, and you're there and you remember, someone has ought against me. Then he says, you leave your offering. The first thing he says you do is you go and be reconciled to your brother. Well, that's still true this morning. If we left our home this morning, with a problem in the marriage. Jesus is teaching us, you know what, the first thing before you bring your sacrifices and offer them before God, first get your relationship right at home. First get your relationship right with mankind. The teaching is clear. If our relationship with man is not right, there is a barrier with our relationship with God, and so deal with it. Deal with it scripturally, but deal with it quickly. Look at the very next verse here in verse 25. Agree with your adversary quickly. See, that follows right on the heels of what we just read. 
Agree with your adversary quickly while you're on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge and the judge hand you over to the officer and you be thrown into prison. So Jesus says, deal with these unrighted wrongs. Deal with them first. Deal with them quickly. Remember in Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, Be angry, sin not. Do not let the sun go down upon your wrath. Paul is teaching the same thing. Deal with these things quickly. When you are angry, the day of your anger needs to be the day of reconciliation. Don't let the sun go down upon your wrath before you've resolved that problem. And he tells us a reason in verse 27. Neither give place to the devil. When we're angry, when we let the sun go down upon our wrath, when we haven't first gone to our brother or our wife or our husband, when we haven't dealt with it quickly, we're giving Satan an opportunity to work within that marriage. And he doesn't need that opportunity. Deal with problems scripturally. Deal with problems quickly. Deal with problems privately. Take your Bibles. We're still going to be in Matthew. But look at Matthew 18. Look what it says here. Matthew 18, you know the context, verses 15 through 17. Look what it says here. Again, here are these unrighted wrongs again. How do I deal with them scripturally? How do I deal with them quickly? Deal with them privately. Look what Jesus says in verse 15. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Now notice this. Between you and him alone. That's where it begins, between you and him alone. And notice how verse 15 ends. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. You've won this one back. You've righted the wrongs. And so you go and tell him his fault between him and you alone. But notice what it goes on to say. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. You see, it begins privately. Couples, here's what I want us to understand. If you cannot deal with the problem, for whatever reason, privately, don't think that you're doing something wrong when you seek help. As long as it's qualified help. As long as it's help that's going to point you to what we're talking about, the scriptures, and to deal with it quickly. We're not talking about wives just talking to other wives about their husband. That's not going to help the matter. We're not talking about men degrading their wives to other men. We're talking about finding someone in whom you have respect, one individual or more that will lead you through the scriptures that will help you find a biblical solution to your dilemma and that will help you navigate your way through that. You see, when we say deal with it privately, we're not saying keep those problems exclusively to yourself. They only get worse, and if you can't figure it out, sometimes it takes another ear, an objective ear, to help both the husband and wife to see what the scriptures have to say. Go through the book of Proverbs sometime and you'll see that the wise increase in hearing and the wise seek wise counsel. Proverbs 1 and verse 5. That's how the book of Proverbs begins. But the fool in verse 7, they're not going to listen to instruction. So don't complicate the problem by saying, no, we're not going to talk to anybody else about this. Again, the wise individual will seek wise counsel. And remember Proverbs 24 and verse 6. In the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Some translations, there is victory. So get some help. Well, look at the next point here. Not only privately, but prayerfully. Remember in Proverbs 15 and verse 8, the prayer of the upright 
is his delight. Talking about God's delight. Deal with problems and deal with those prayerfully. Jesus taught a parable one time in Luke 18 and verse 1 that men ought always to pray and not lose heart. Those two things go together. When we stop praying as we should, don't be surprised if you don't lose heart. Don't be surprised if you become discouraged. And so men ought always to pray, why, Lord, that you won't lose heart. It's God's delight for His children to bring their cares and to cast them upon Him, for He cares for you. 1 Peter 5 and verse 7. Pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 17. You remember in James 4 and verse 2? You have not because you ask not. Again, many times we withhold the blessings because we're not seeking them. We're not asking, we're not seeking, we're not knocking at the right door, heaven's door, the throne of grace. Well, look also, deal with them humbly. We know that God is opposed to the proud, James 4 and verse 6. But the same scripture goes on to say, but he gives grace to the humble. Recognize that the problem could be your fault. It's hard for us, husbands, wives, to assume the blame at times. But once again, recognize with a very humble disposition that this could be my fault. Galatians 6 verses 1 and 2. If any man is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Some translations, humility. Notice that. That's how we go to each other. Whether it's a brother or sister overtaken in a trespass, whether it is a wife or a husband during times of trouble, problems. Go to each other with some humility and recognize that we can deal with this scripturally. We can deal with it quickly and privately and prayerfully. Well, we don't stop there wisely. Remember Proverbs 14 and verse 1, the wise woman? Now notice what it's talking about. The wise woman builds her house. The foolish woman tears it down with her own hands. And that's what's going to happen when we deal with problems. One of the two. We're either going to be building up our home, we're either going to be making more secure and solid that foundation upon which our marriage rests, or we're going to be tearing that marriage apart. The wise woman builds her house. The foolish tears it down with her own hands. Later on, we see that wise woman, the virtuous woman, in Proverbs 31, verse 26, she opens her mouth in wisdom. The teaching of kindness is on her tongue. And so there again is that wisdom, not only with the wife, but with the husband. James 1 and verse 5 tells us to pray for wisdom. Let's not be like those mentioned in Romans 1 and verse 22. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. That's what many a husband and many a wife do. So arrogant, so proud, they're not going to deal with the problem because it's not my problem, it's hers, it's his. They find that way that seems right to them, but it only leads to death. And so professing themselves to be wise, they become fools. They end up dismantling that home that was established by God Almighty. What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Matthew 19 and verse 6. And of course, the last thought here, lovingly. This, this is how we deal with problems. This is how we solve problems. It is the biblical response to problems, lovingly. You remember 1 John 4 and verse 8, our God is love. And you read 1 John and that's how he's teaching us to deal with one another. We're not to love with word or with tongue, but in deed and in truth, 1 John 3 and verse 18. So the point is, don't just say it, do it. Demonstrate that love. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 14, let all that you do be done in love. In 1 Peter 4 and verse 8, 
Keep fervent in your love one for another because love covers a multitude of sin. In Song of Solomon, the last chapter near the end, verse 8, chapter 8 and verse 7, you remember what's happened there? Song of Solomon is a beautiful treatise looking at married love. And what you're finding throughout that Song of Solomon, love has been tried. But love, as it always will be, if it's love for God and love for each other, love will be tried, but love will be triumphant. Many waters cannot quench love nor will rivers overflow them. So love is tried, but love is triumphant. How to deal with problems? Remember what we've said. The act of problem solving. That's for next Sunday morning. The art of problem solving. This is what we do if we want problems solved. And think about the application this morning. As the invitation of Christ is extended, sin causes problems. Sin separates us from God. And we deal with that problem in the same fashion. We deal with it scripturally. We go to the Word of God. We find out how much He loves us. That because He loved humanity, mankind, He sent His only begotten Son, John 3.16, Because greater love than this has no man. Jesus laid down his life for his friends. John 15 and verse 13. And if we love him, we'll keep his commandments. John 14 and verse 15. I hope this morning, if you've never obeyed the gospel of Christ, let biblical love compel you, control you to do that. Motivate you to do that. You'll never regret it. And as husbands and wives, If there's one problem within the congregation here, let's understand how serious that is. Resolve as husband and as wife to eliminate that problem with God's help. It can happen. It will happen if we place our confidence in God Almighty. If you're subject to the invitation this morning, won't you please come as right now we stand together and sing.